Uh, yeah, so my name is Seahorn. Um, uh, today's talk is uh, Apache Iceberg's Best Secret uh, Guide to Metadata Tables. Um, so, uh, yeah, I'll just introduce myself quickly. Uh, I'm a software engineer at Apple. Um, so I work on Apache Iceberg. And uh, before that, I used to be work on Apache Hive in uh, Cloudera and Crypto. Uh, in Apache, I'm a committer PMC of Hive. And uh, since joining Apple, I'm really interested in Iceberg. I became a committer earlier this year. Um, so a little bit about our projects. Uh, Apache Iceberg, I think in big data world, kind of like a new, new uh, one of the newer projects. Uh, it was developed to address the shortcomings of Hive. Um, it incubated uh, 2018, graduated 2020, and uh, now has a lot of uh, big community, almost 300 uh, unique contributors. We also collaborate a lot with the other communities like Spark, Flink, Chino. Uh, because they're kind of like our interfaces. Um, so there's a lot of work on those communities also to uh, for Iceberg. And this year, really, Iceberg, I think, has uh, grown in adoption. A lot of companies announcing support for Iceberg in their commercial distribution, as you may see. Uh, so it's really great for the community right now. Uh, so this talk is about metadata table. But before that, uh, actually, uh, can I, how many of you guys use Iceberg or was before? Okay, like about half. Yeah, I'll try to make the talk uh, accessible even to new newcomers of Iceberg. Uh, so I'll spend like a few minutes just explaining some of the background of Iceberg and slowly make my way to metadata tables. Uh, so first, uh, what is Iceberg? Uh, officially, the definition is the open table format for analytic data sets. And so to break that down, uh, table format is basically layout of files on a table. The way to contrast that with the old one, like Hive, is to Hive is a directory-based table format. Like every file in the directory is part of the table. And then Hive had this concept of partitions, which are subdirectories, but that's also directory-based. All the files in the subdirectory are part of the partition. Uh, Iceberg is actually metadata file-based uh, table format. Metadata file is a new concept. Uh, basically, they're pointers to other metadata files and eventually data files. And the idea is you follow those metadata files to find the files of a table. And metadata files also have partition information, so you've also follow that to find membership of a partition. So, you know, it's on the surface, it sounds like a quite a small change, almost trivial change, but uh, it allows us to build a lot of things in these metadata files for a lot of features that uh, Hive had trouble supporting. Um, so some of those features, uh, there's like so many, but I, I'll have time to talk about just four of them. Um, the main feature, I guess, that kickstarted Iceberg, uh, I, I think at least, is the, uh, uh, move to cloud, right? So when we move from Hadoop file system to object store like S3 or S3-like uh, systems, uh, a lot of the assumptions people make about directories is no longer holding. Like for example, uh, atomicity, consistency, right? Like used to be that when you list the files in the directory, it's consistent. Now on S3, it's eventually consistent. Um, when you move the directory, Hive used to do that for atomicity, but now move is no longer atomic, right? So that's why uh, initially we made the metadata file to keep all the data listing in a metadata file allows it to be first consistent. It's all on one file. And secondly, uh, updating is atomic because you're just making like a new file. Um, so that's the first uh, thing. But with that, we build like a lot more features. We think, oh, now we have metadata files that you follow to get data files. So why don't we keep the old state of the uh, metadata file so we can go back in time, right? It's a really cool feature called time travel in Iceberg. So now every snapshot, uh, well, every operation, it makes something called a snapshot file. So this is like an old metadata pointer, and you can always go back in time following those pointers to find the state of a table at some point in the past. I think that's a pretty cool feature. Uh, and then we build on top of that to make um, something called isolation level. So isolation level in database world is like um, how do concurrent transactions, like uh, they should be logically independent from each other. And if you know, like databases, they use a lot of like transaction ID, kind of MPCC things. And the snapshot information on a data file allows us to do that. Um, in Hive, a directory-based system, you have to get exclusive lock on the whole directory in order to guarantee uh, isolation. Uh, that could be very expensive. You know, like this lock could take uh, many hours as the job writes into the directory. Uh, it's very crude. And Iceberg allows us with each data file annotated with the snapshot ID to just do a quick check of conflicting snapshots before commit. Uh, so it's very fast, sub seconds. Uh, and finally, the last one, uh, maybe the more important one is the um, uh, iceberg performance. So what does the um, 
performance mean for table format? It, it actually just means kind of reducing the amount of data that the engine has to read. So in Hive, the way was the, the partitioning, like the directory, subdirectory concepts, where if your column uh, was not selected by the query, or sorry, the column value, then you would just prune away that directory and not read that. But it's uh, it works, but it's very crude because you cannot prune beyond the directory. Like if your directory has a thousand files, you can't just prune like half of that away. So Iceberg does two things. Uh, first, we the metadata file is kind of a hierarchy and the partition stats are at every level. So we can even prune earlier on in when we go down in the reading the metadata files. And secondly, uh, we also put uh, min-max column stats, which um, allows us to, even if your query doesn't hit the partition columns, be able to prune away files. Uh, that's something Hive wasn't able to do unless you open the files themselves. So uh, yeah, sorry, it's a little fast, but uh, these are kind of like things that Iceberg uh, has in metadata files to allow us to do like all these really cool features. So now I'll get to the main topic of the talk is about uh, uh, metadata tables. And so it's actually about the first part of that sentence, Iceberg being an open table format. So to me, I mean, it's open to interpretation, but to me, what that word means open is that, uh, yes, the metadata files are there for all, you know, Iceberg used metadata files for all these really cool features. But uh, the fact is that they're actually open for you and me as users to also able to query them in a very user-friendly way uh, in the form of metadata tables. And uh, for example, they're exposed as SQL, like you can query them using SQL just as easy as you can query the data tables. And secondly, uh, performance of metadata tables is really good. It's actually better than the data table because you read only the metadata files, which are much smaller than the data files. Um, so this actually brings me, I think, to probably in the list by like the fifth, usually this is like an unnamed advantage of Iceberg over Hive, I think. Uh, but to me, it's the, probably the best advantage is that it's a fully transparent system. Uh, with just one view, you're able to see exactly how Iceberg lays out all the files. And uh, user and increasingly systems can even uh, improve how Iceberg lays out the files. So I think it's really cool. Um, in my experience, a lot of tough problems you can solve by metadata table queries, like, for example, performance problems, scale problems. And uh, you can even decide how to preempti preemptively optimize the table so that you don't hit the problem later. And uh, if I have time, I'll also show how to build stuff beyond Iceberg. So, you know, Iceberg uses metadata files for these four things, which is really cool. But uh, there's no limit. With that metadata, you can build even systems beyond. So I'll try to show how to build advanced monitoring uh, data quality and uh, additional things. All right, so uh, uh, first is going to be the first metadata table I'll talk about is partitions table. And uh, so this is an experience, like my personal experience, how I got into Iceberg. Uh, I think uh, some users may also hit this as well. So the first day I uh, installed Iceberg, uh, I was asked to look at Iceberg. I remember installing it. And then I, the first thing I did was before running a query, I'm kind of used to Hive. So in Hive, uh, what's the first thing you do before you run a query, right? So I usually you do show partitions because it's like you don't want to be the, you know, uh, do full table scan and uh, eat up all the cluster resources. So it's always good to know how the, you know, the partitions are laid out. So I did a show partitions and I remember, uh, sorry, the text is a bit small, but uh, I remember the error message I got was saying the table does not support the partition management. And I remember being just very confused because, uh, you know, Iceberg, uh, it's my first day, I was thinking, okay, Iceberg, the docs say it supports partitions, so what's going on? And I remember asking on our Slack channel and uh, uh, Russell, who's a committer in PMC uh, based out in New Orleans, um, he actually answered my question. He said, oh, like, we don't have the uh, show partition statement in Iceberg. In fact, what we have is something called metadata table, uh, a partitions metadata table, and you access that scene saying, db.table.partitions, uh, db and table being your uh, db name and table name. And so I was like, okay, that's cool. And I tried it, uh, I queried it. Uh, so I, you know, this select from the db.table.partitions and uh, blah. So uh, first, and two things stuck out to me, I remember. Like first thing was, uh, this is really cool because it's actually a SQL statement, right? Like show partitions in Hive is not a SQL. Like you can't really do anything beyond it in terms of SQL functions, SQL aggregations, anything like that. Uh, this is much more natural. Like now, like for example, I immediately start ordering by columns, things like that. And then secondly, um, it has different fields like that I've never had, for example, record count and file counts. 
And I thought that was just really cool. Like these are like very useful things I think to show along with partition. So uh, I, I was sold immediately on Iceberg uh, after this point. So um, I've, yeah, so I, I thought, you know, being very curious, I was uh, digging deep, like how did they implement this record count, file count thing? And uh, I found out, you know, like later that partitions table is actually just an aggregate view of another metadata table called files table. And in fact, um, Iceberg has like a dozen metadata tables, all with very interesting information. And uh, I'll, uh, yeah, it's going to be kind of hard to go through all of them, but I'll try to like go through the big categories of these tables today and try to show you how to use them in the different production scenarios. Um, so I guess the, the one thing to try to organize all that is to um, understand that metadata tables are a view of metadata files. So uh, it's always good. Like I always like to put this diagram up to show the iceberg metadata files and then just like one-to-one -one correspond with metadata tables. Um, and so the only thing really to know about metadata files is that they're hierarchical. Like the metadata file, each of them points to a set of children file, which then point to more children, which then point to the data files. Um, so the first, the first thing on top is actually outside metadata file. This is a catalog, which uh, I think Sam did a really good talk on. It's, a, it's an external thing that its only job is to point to the top level metadata file, like the root metadata file. The root metadata file then points to a set of files technically called manifest list, but for this talk, I'll call them snapshot files because that's what they really are. They're kind of the things that allow us to go back in time, uh, look at different snapshots. And then that snapshot file has children called manifest files, and that has children called data files. So quite a simple, you know, hierarchical structure, nothing uh, very, very crazy there. And so that immediately allows us to map to like at least four categories of the metadata tables. Um, the first one being the newest table. Uh, oh, sorry. Um, one aside here is that when you query a metadata table and you, you think, like logically, you would think you're opening that level of metadata file. But actually, it's uh, better than what you intuitively think. You actually open the level above because it's the, uh, the parent that has all the metadata about the layer below. Just to give an example, when you query manifest table, like intuitively, you might think, oh, I'm opening like every single manifest, but you're actually not. You're querying the snapshot uh, files and just getting metadata about that. So your query is actually faster than you think. That's the main point there. Uh, but yeah, so the first uh, table is the metadata logs table, and it's about the the root file is the newest table added, I think. Uh, it's the only exception to the rule just because uh, it's the root and there's no parent. So actually what we do is we just ask the last metadata file, which has back corners to the previous ones. But the rest of them kind of follow this rule pretty well. Like snapshots file, or sorry, snapshots table queries the root metadata file uh, for a list of snapshot files. Then manifest files query the snapshot files for manifest files. Then the rest of them, uh, I'll explain why as like there's so many. Uh, query the manifest file for the information about data files. So it's just, you query the top one to get information about the, the one you're looking for. So why is there, okay, so that's like four of them. So why are there like the other eight uh, metadata tables? Uh, and the answer is, um, so most users I think use, are, are most interested about how their data is laid out, not really how Iceberg metadata is laid out. So we just have a lot of views of the data file information. Uh, for user convenience. So they can just kind of find the table that they, they're more specific to what they're looking for and then just query that. Um, the best example is the first one I just showed, the partitions table. So partitions table is an aggregate view of files table, right? So uh, each file tracks the partition they belong to. So the only way to know partition the list is to go through all the files, but, but we don't want user to always have to know like to go to files table. So that's why we have a partitions table It's like kind of a convenience for them. Uh, and the next two, uh, you will see files and entries table. Uh, initially I was like really confused and I thought these are two different things, but actually they're the same, uh, they're the same thing actually. Like they're the same thing in terms of they're both about something called manifest entry, which is just a row of the manifest file, which is in fact just metadata about data file. And why are there two? Well, the files table is the one I guess Iceberg community more promotes because it's easier to understand. It's just the fields that correspond to the physical as aspects of the file, like the you know, file length, file location, uh, file formats, column stats. So things that you don't really need to think too much about. And then entries is a little more advanced. It has more fields like what's the snapshot that added this file. So you have to know a little bit about iceberg. Um, so that's why I think files table is usually preferred if your query can be answered just that. 
just by that. But uh, in my example, sometimes I'll use entries table because I need to know correspondence with snapshots. Um, and then there's, you also see in the list all underscore tables. And what those are is again, a kind of a convenience uh, in the sense that Iceberg, as I said, kind of keeps old historic snapshots. But uh, by default, you know, when you query it, you're not going to, you're always going to see the current snapshot, right? If you query the data table without specifying anything, you're only going to see current data. So similarly for metadata tables, if you don't put all, you'll just see the metadata of the current snapshot. But if you put all, you'll see the metadata files of the previous snapshots as well. Um, and then finally, there's these uh, dichotomy between, you'll see data file, delete file table, uh, recently added. And uh, that one I, I won't have time to talk about today, but there's a concept in Iceberg called delete files that came out in B2, which are, you know, delete vectors that you apply to data files. But uh, for today's talk, I'm just going to use files table just to simplify files being kind of a unified view of both. Uh, so that was kind of like my uh, whirlwind uh, kind of uh, tour of the metadata tables. And I'm going to try now to use them to answer uh, interesting questions about Iceberg. Um, so some kind of commonly asked questions, uh, I guess the first category is going to be about, uh, partitions. So partitions are still hugely popular as a way to organize data. Like they were in Hive. That's the only way in Hive and Iceberg. A lot of people still use that, which is really cool. Uh, for example, people like to partition by day and hour, for example. Um, so, you know, people like to understand in their pipelines and stuff. So they ask questions like how many files do I have in each partition or uh, what's the total file size of each partition or even uh, uh, when's the, each partition uh, updated last. And so I'll go, these kind of questions can be answered from the easiest to the hardest using metadata tables. So the first one, how many files per partition is easiest because it's, um, if you remember my first table, partitions table already has that, it has file count already. So you just select partition file count from partitions table and you're done. Uh, second one, how many, what's the total size of a partition is a bit harder because uh, we didn't actually put the total size as a property on the partitions table. Uh, like we could have, but we just uh, didn't. So you have to here go to the underlying table, which is the files table. So you remember the files, each file keeps track of the partition value. So what you do is you query files table, you group by the partition value. So now you have groups of files belonging to a partition. And for each group, you just sum up the file size. So a little more, more advanced, but not too too hard, I think. And then the third one is uh, last update time per partition. Also a very user favorite question. Uh, this one's probably like the query looks the hardest, but um, I think if you uh, like understand the concept, it's it's okay. So here, um, if you remember, I said there's like two tables, like files and entries. And entries has the information about snapshots. And here, unfortunately, you have to deal with snapshot because in Iceberg, uh, update time means snapshot commit time. Like a, tape, uh, a file is not part of Iceberg until it's committed by a snapshot. Um, and so you have to essentially join entries table with snapshots table to get the snapshot commit time. But after that, it's the same thing. You group by the partition. So now you have like, you know, different file entries per partition, and then you find the max commit time out of each group. So hopefully that's uh, understandable. It, uh, this kind of like lets me transition, I guess, to the next set of questions, which is about snapshots in Iceberg. Um, and to, I want to clarify one thing has also caused some confusion to users to term snapshot. Uh, I think in my opinion, like snapshot is used like maybe a little, um, like for different meanings in Iceberg. So I'll try to clarify that. Um, the first, I guess most people think of snapshot as just a list of, yeah, you know, the state of a table at some time, essentially like the list of files at some time in Iceberg. If you remember, like every commit makes a new, uh, snapshot file, and then you just follow that to find the state at that time. So that's like the most useful or most common definition, but snapshot ID in some cases in iceberg refers to actually an operation, right? Because it's one to one, one operation makes one snapshot. So when you see entries that snapshot ID that I used in the previous slide, that's, is that, that's actually what that one is. It's actually the snapshot that made this file, not the snapshot that referred to this file. It's like kind of two different things. Um, and then entries table also has a status field, which is like what the snapshot did to this file, because we not only track additions, we also track file deletions, file rewrites, things like that. So um, to try to uh, as an exercise, like um, some questions we can ask about snapshots also with metadata files. So these two questions are kind of like uh, similar, but again, 
uh, slightly different, right? So first one is what files were added by snapshot foo. So like an operation that made snapshot foo, what files were added? Um, so here you use the entries table dot snapshot ID equal foo, uh, status equal one, meaning added. And then you'll get all the list of files added by foo. Um, as here, you know, status equal two would mean it's uh, what files were deleted by foo. So, uh, and then what files are referenced by foo is, a, it's again, a different question. So example, like, you know, like snapshot foo may have added five files, but it still points to like, you know, 900 files of the previous snapshot. So, you know, it's like 905 is a total. And so uh, here, uh, actually metadata table, there's no field here that will help you, uh, but you actually have to use time travel. And so um, this is a good introduction to iceberg time travel, like in the data table, the way to do time travel is just select uh, from the table version as of foo, and then you'll get like the data as of time foo. But here I'm showing you can do it even for metadata files. You can even say select from uh, files table as of foo and get the list of files as of time foo. I think it's, uh, so that's how to answer that question. I think it's kind of useful. Um, cool. And then next uh, topics is how to keep uh, iceberg, like iceberg maintenance operations which are, again, a, a, you know, a, kind of a very broad topic. Um, there, and, but metadata tables can help you know when to do them and how to do them. Uh, and the three I'll talk about are first, expired snapshots, uh, which maybe some of you know, is um, the fact that Iceberg, you know, it's really cool that we keep previous snapshots and we keep all the pointers, but after a while, this does fill up. And so you do need to expire them to reclaim this space. Uh, rewrite manifest is another operation to do periodically. That's because metadata files get defragmented and uh, kind of unorganized and you want to get them in a better shape. And finally, uh, rewrite files is data file optimization, meaning data files also get unoptimized and you have to rewrite them to get in a better shape. Um, so the first part is about expired snapshots. Um, so when the user comes with this, it's actually maybe all, a lot of times it's a little too late. They always ask like, um, and it's usually a user on HDFS who runs out of the space because on HDFS, if you know, they have this file quotas. And so it's like a hard exception when you hit that. So usually they'll, if they're kind of new to Iceberg, they'll ask like, uh, you know, I've already tried compaction to reduce number of files. I already tried deletion to remove files. So why am I still seeing the quota limit? And the answer most probably is they need to expire snapshots. But to sh uh, determine whether that's the case, I always ask them to query these two tables first. Uh, can you query the all manifests and all files? So just a reminder, like all underscore whatever is just like seeing all the metadata files or all the files at that point and in all points in time. Uh, and then I ask them to compare with manifests and files, which only show that for the current snapshot. And if the first one is much greater than the second one, um, essentially, yeah, then, you know, you, you did the right job. You just got to expire snapshots and that should take care of the problem. But if the second one, you know, even your current snapshot has huge numbers of files or manifest, then you, you did something wrong, your, your compaction or deletion didn't do what you think, and you should look at that. So I usually do that to triage the problem. Um, and then uh, I also I like to put this in dashboards as well, just so, because uh, I mean, it's such a common thing to know whether expired snapshots, um, how many of your disks is consumed by old snapshots versus new snapshots, I like to put on a dashboard. It's always kind of a balance in Iceberg between keeping like too many snapshots, uh, but then also having enough to go back in time. Watch it. So, kind of. A... Um, and then another way, another metadata table, data table that shows almost uh, it's just another way to solve the same problem is uh, snapshots table also has very useful fields. A uh, bit of an overlap with the other the other way, but uh, snapshots table each snapshot has a, you know commit time snapshot ID, but also a summary that you can also check out. Summary has, uh, it's like a struct with different fields, like uh, number of files, um, uh, num size of files, things like that. So you can also use this to eyeball whether most of your stuff was in the old snapshot. Uh, but here you have to kind of know which, uh, which is the current snapshot uh, by the timestamp. So that's another thing. Um, and then the next one is optimized metadata. So um, optimizing metadata is really important for Iceberg because, you know, if you have too many metadata files, the query planning time becomes really big. Uh, you're spending a lot of time just opening small files. And for this talk, even querying metadata tables becomes slow because, I mean, essentially, if you're opening metadata files. So the questions I like to ask for meta, like uh, kind of like meta questions for, for how to do this is how many first, 
uh, how many, just how many metadata files do you have? Like, so I just do count from manifest uh, table. And typically rule of thumb is like, if this number is uh, like much, it should be kind of like less than number of partitions. I mean, it depends on the table, but typically one manifest can support uh, files of many partitions. So uh, like the, that number is probably the most useful. You can also break it down. Like manifest table has uh, fields like, uh, 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 like how many files so you can eyeball to see if certain manifest files are causing the problem. Um, and finally, uh, more advanced technique I like to do, but not, I think it's not for really everyone. Uh, it's like, sometimes you can even, um, organize your metadata files so that each talks to, uh, kind of, you kind of sort them. Uh, what, so sorting just means each manifest file, you know, keeps track of partition stats and, uh, of all the data files that it has kind of like the upper and lower bound, and you can kind of make them somewhat sorted so that each uh, go over uh, have a discrete set of partitions that way when the pruning happens uh you don't have to read like a lot of manifests it's more of an advanced technique and the you know this so but yeah the point here is that the manifest table has an interesting field called partition summaries that gives you lower and upper bound information about all the partitions that the manifest refers to so kind of useful and then uh, the last one is about uh, optimizing of um, iceberg uh, data, right? The, this was, you know, the, um, probably the most useful one to do, I guess. Well, I mean, they're all they're all quite useful, but this one uh, gives you immediate uh, benefit for query performance time, just because you know the small file problem. If you have too many small files, you're spending so much time opening each uh, file. And also, uh, interesting point, like uh, I think one really good flag to do here is to sort the data files because when you sort them. Uh, first, you you make the min max bounds uh, uh, tighter for each column, so that when you do the filtering, you can like filter out a lot more columns or a lot more files. And uh, when you actually put the similar records together, you can get better compression ratios of just a uh, added bonus. Uh, for the like whether or not you have too many small files, uh, the question I always ask for metadata tables is select from files. Um, I always like to group by partition just to show. But I just select kind of the first, the file count, obviously. And then I also like to select um, average size, which, you know, is just the sum of the size divided by file count. Sometimes file count is not that helpful if the table is big to begin with, right? You don't know whether it's natural or not. But if you see average size uh, be like, you know, kilobytes or something, then you're doing something wrong. Um, it's Your query performance is going to be pretty terrible. Uh, it should at least kind of be like a block size, like a HDFS block size, right? Kind of a tried and true value. Um, and then the second thing, like whether the the data files are sorted, um, is a it's also there in the files table. Um, uh, so this field actually is uh, not available yet. This is a PRI I I, I have. It's uh, up for review, but uh, it's possible to do without this field. It's just like easier to do here. Uh, without this field, you have to do a little massaging. But yeah, each file keeps track of the lower and upper bound for all the columns by default. So. You, uh, it's very useful to to visualize and, and see whether you, you want to sort the data files or not. Cool. So I think um, that's actually it for Iceberg. Um, I do have kind of like uh, additional bonus thing, like uh, what you can do beyond Iceberg. Right? I think I promised that at the beginning of the talk. So like, for example, we had a use case for um, monitoring an ingest system. Um, and monitoring ingest system means usually like you want to measure data latency, data completeness. I mean, this is a very tough problem, right? Like, and in, in usually in industry, like, how do you even do that? Uh, typically, you have to divide both the source and destination by the same, like, bucketed by the same event time, and then kind of compare the size of the two to get the completeness. And then latency is even trickier. Like, you have to, you know, make sure the times align and everything. But I was able to do just two quick queries in Iceberg metadata tables. Um, our setup being, you know, we had uh, ingest from Flink, uh, from Kafka to Flink to Iceberg. And our rows, each row obviously had to have the event time in order to track the event time being the event creation time. So we can go back and, and track latency. But yeah, uh, it's like when we bucketed the iceberg table by event time hour, um, the data completeness calculation became very easy. We just count how many records per, per partition, which is exactly the same as the partition on, the, on, on, our, on our event source. So we were able to find the graph the completeness pretty well. Uh, like how many records successfully landed to iceberg and um uh, data latency is also uh doable uh, surprisingly so data latency this query is a uh, reminiscent a bit of the last update time per partition if you remember that kind of big query similar concept you know for entries table we're finding 
drawing a snapshot table to find kind of the max commit time. But here, instead of finding max commit time, we're finding the max difference of commit time and the event time, of the lowest event time. And but so you might ask, how can we find the lowest event time? That's, but actually, if you remember, uh, iceberg metadata table is track min max for all the columns, including event time. So we're just able to get that from from this uh, from this table. And uh, yeah, here is like uh, the example without my column, well, without my the column I adding the readable metrics. So you have to kind of know the column ID here. But uh, yeah, the idea is kind of the sim similar thing. Um, and then, uh, yeah, so you can do a lot of things, like just to sh give an idea of what Iceberg has. I mean, there's a lot more I don't have time to cover, but like column stats, for example, you know, we, we keep track of not only min max, like column size, no values, uh, and invalid values, not like not a number of values. And that's just very useful, I think, for data quality. It's under underused feature, I think. Uh, just be able to like uh, periodically do health checks on your tables to make sure you don't have invalid values, things like that. Um, yeah, and then uh, last one is just uh, there's a lot of development going on Iceberg. You know, like people are voting more things to Iceberg spec. It's a very active community, and eventually, I hope a lot of all those will get exposed to everyone as metadata tables. I think one cool thing to look forward to for me is the Puffin files. So Puffin spec was just voted like I think a month or two back. And Puffin Files is a, a room for even more statistics, like room filters and uh, data sketches, things like that. So eventually you can imagine, you know, this to be implemented, but if this was in metadata tables, you could do get a lot of information like histograms, count distinct estimations, and like all the cool things you can do with, with all that stuff too. Um, yeah, so um, I think that's that actually it for me. What were the questions? Yeah, the third file format on that iceberg measurements. Iceberg, yeah, supports like three. We support uh, Parquet, Avro, and um, Orc. And uh, I think like Parquet and Orc are more columnar, so they're more better for analytic queries, and Avro is better for write. Like, if write performance is a thing. Wondering is that recommended? How does you fast on your what do you want to Exactly, yeah, it just uh, depends on the use case. Is there a major difference on collecting this stats? I assume all these are right then. Yeah, actually, that's a good point. On you might, yeah, actually, I should have said that. Like on Avro, you you miss you do miss a few stats. Uh, in Parquet and Orc, it's built in just because those files already collect the stats. So all we do is just copy the stats to Iceberg Metadata. So, wow. yeah. Is it part of the specific specification? Like, that's where the people team is out there and but they schemas. What do you do for the differentiation with the type? Uh, yeah, it's, it's a specific, it's, um, that's, that's a good question. I mean, um, the metadata table class is kind of specified. It's in iceberg core, uh, but it's up to the engine, how to implement that. So between Spark and Trino, you will see differences. Although we try to as much as possible to unify that. Uh, but the, the, most of the data should be the same, but maybe some of the column names and types are a little different. Uh, yes. Regarding the optimization of the metadata, it's a little short up, right? Is this all, is it a Yakut strip for in that we state to look and be Yeah, exactly. So that's why I was saying like metadata tables are great for if you want to build a system. And increasingly, I think a lot of companies are building systems like uh, maybe tabular or something. And they like to build uh, systems that, you know, use metadata files to determine how to optimize the data ahead of time. Uh, like a typical example, you know, like uh, data comes in maybe VF Flake or something. It comes very small. And you want to always just rewrite that to bigger, uh, you know, files for query performance. Yes. I don't recall seeing the metadata tables as queryable for Petrino. And I, I, I no, I, I, maybe at some point in time, the latest version of Trino have that. Yeah. But, uh, they're definitely a little be uh, behind. I think Spark. Uh, was the first to implement them, and Trino is, uh, I think, a little bit behind. Uh, so, but they should have all of them soon. So the SQL should be very similar in uh, Trino as it is. Yeah, I think you know, the only thing I found is sometimes in Trino, maybe it's just me. I have to use like a dollar sign. I can't put too many dots in the table name. Uh, but that's just like a small, small thing. Ah, uh, yes. I, I need to. I swear. Sure. No. Be very good for at the still solo extend that five for men after make sure it's reversible like but with Nat also. I feel like it is more like a database. Ah yeah. It's yeah. Yeah. Correct. Yeah. With it. Then if so, can you compare like compare the other like, column of the database? 
how do you think these proposes to the V? Oh, call in their database, like which database? Vertica, all right. Yeah, I think it will be, uh, so definitely, you know, Iceberg is trying to get as much performance as it can out of this format, but, you know, obviously, um, uh, yeah, I guess it's, it's hard to compare. There's many things, right? Like, uh, for example, Iceberg, you have to always make sure that it is optimized, right? You have to make sure we can benefit from columnar format. We have to always make, you know, kind of a, a good size, a properly sized columnar file in order to get good performance. Uh, and then you have to enable, like, yeah, by default, all the statistics are enabled. So yeah, in certain cases, I guess it could approach that, but, uh, yeah, I think Vertica is probably just like more optimized from top to bottom. Whereas, you know, I Iceberg is just the file format and you need all the, it's up to the engine really to, to there's like Trino and Spark, uh, it's different engine also have different, uh, behavior as well, how they distribute the query and things like that. So yes. So, uh, is your question, do we support Hadoop process? On the act the process. Ah, yeah. So, uh, that's a good question. I think, uh, yeah, I don't know if there was uh, any talk this time, but yeah, we have something called file IO, which is a pluggable interface, but by default, you know, uh, we use the Hadoop file IO, which is Hadoop file system, which then can just access like S3 Hadoop system. But, uh, actually one background is that I think the, some guys wrote the S3 file IO because they think it's faster than Hadoop file system to access S3. Uh, one thing is Iceberg, as you know, we don't use directories. So Hadoop file system, a lot of, in my experience, a lot of the overhead of Hadoop file system was kind of like simulating directories. Uh, and so by making a dedicated file IO, we're able to like shortcut all of that and just uh, get to the file directly. Oh, yes. With the bio spoke about optimization that they can do by basically multi page back. So they know before and what ranges the file is what you get. So they try to put optimizations to set that more aggressively. Oh, okay. It's related to your shin that sits in uh, between file system merit, uh, the application, when the oh. read up. So we'll, we'll take you some optimization that you can do. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. I think, uh, it's, uh, S3 file IO is, uh, you know, like it's open contribution or we could write a different file IO that just implements, cause the interface is just like read path, write path. And so you can obviously use the vector IO for, for that. Is it S3 specific, uh, or there's most, the biggest performance when you come to win. Okay. Yeah. So that's, uh, yeah, actually like the SC file, one benefit is on the other side, right? We actually use the multi-part upload, uh, versus Hadoop file system, which I'm not sure does this, but yeah, here we do like kind of a parallel uh, uploads. Any other iceberg question? Yeah, sure.